In the 1784 essay on enlightenment, Kant says that the free public use of reason is the only thing required for the enlightenment of mankind. And in that essay, his primary concern seems to be with forms of censorship, with primarily the king deciding what we can and cannot talk about in public and publish about. Now, that concern is going to continue into the 1786 essay, but in the 1786 essay uh, on orienting oneself and thinking, I want you to notice that Kant is now going to give us a list of three things that all stand in the way of what he calls freedom to think. And here we want to understand freedom to think in exactly the sense that we have been talking about the free public use of reason. Free thinking is going to constitute the heart of enlightenment. Thinking for yourself will be thinking freely. So I want to take a look at the list of three things in the essay, What Does It Mean to Orient Oneself in Thinking, that Kant says all stand in the way of or prevent free thinking. First, Kant will say, the freedom to think is opposed to civil compulsion. And by civil compulsion, he means laws. In other words, laws preventing us from discussing certain ideas in public, laws preventing us from publishing about certain ideas. In other words, this is a direct restatement of the concern of the 1784 essay on enlightenment. But here, Kant really drives the point home. You'll say that the government can take away our ability to speak about things or to write about things, but the government can't take away my ability to think freely for myself. But remember, when we're talking about thinking, we're talking about reasoning. And when we're talking about reasoning, we are talking about attempting to figure out what's true. Now, Kant says, how correctly can I think? In other words, how much can I actually get to what's true if I'm not allowed to discuss my idea with other people? The problem here, of course, is that thinking has blind spots. You make mistakes and they are invisible to you. You reach a limit on your thinking and you can't tell that it's your limit. I can't tell the difference between what I believe and what's actually true. And so, unless I can discuss my ideas with other people, I can't actually make any progress. And if I'm not making any progress, then I'm not reasoning. I'm not really thinking. But in other words, what I really need when I discuss my ideas with other people is not just for them to hear me out. It's not just for them to smile and nod politely. What I really need is for other people to criticize, to show me where they think I've made a mistake. But, and here's the important part, that means that unless you are thinking for yourself, I can't think for myself. Unless you are willing to publicly speak about this and respond to me and show me where I've gone wrong, I can't make any progress. And so it's not just a matter of being able to publish or say what I like. More importantly here is to be able to find an audience to engage in open and honest conversation about my ideas. If you won't hear me out, I can't think for myself. If you won't think critically, I can't think for myself. If you won't respond and tell me where I've made a mistake, I can't think for myself. Your very best friends in the whole world are the people who are willing to calmly explain to you why you are wrong about everything. Now, it doesn't seem like that always at the time. It seems like your best friends are the ones who say, you're awesome, or you're right, or I agree with you, but I don't get anything from that. What I make progress from is people who are willing to show me why they think I'm wrong. And so, if you stop me from having these conversations, if I am not legally allowed to discuss certain ideas, then I'm just not going to be brave enough to do it anyway. And now fear and uh, laziness are going to stop us from thinking for ourselves. So civil compulsion, just as we said in the 1784 essay on enlightenment, will prevent us from thinking freely for ourselves. Now, if civil compulsion is just a restatement of the major concern of the essay on enlightenment, this second point where Kant talks about compulsion over conscience, 
he seems to now be paying attention to a deeper problem. Now, what does compulsion over conscience mean? Well, after all, what is conscience? It's that Jiminy Cricket sitting on your shoulder telling you when you're about to do something wrong. Now, I want you to think about how conscience works, what it does. Your conscience is not your uh, theory about right and wrong. This is not ethics. This is not philosophy. Conscience is that feeling, that dreadful feeling that I get when I'm about to do the wrong thing. It's that feeling that I get when I really ought to do something even if I don't want to do it. It's that gnawing feeling of guilt I get when I've done the wrong thing. And so conscience is this feeling that just boils up and prevents me from doing the wrong thing or bothers me when I have done the wrong thing. Now does conscience always reliably show you right from wrong? No. It doesn't have to be really wrong for me to feel guilty about it. I just need to have been raised to feel guilty about it. And likewise, if I haven't been raised to feel like something is wrong, I'm not going to feel guilty about it, even if it turns out to be terrible. Think about if I have grown up, I don't know, racist or sexist or something. I can treat other people terribly and not feel guilty about it. And so, of course, conscience, again, is not thinking through what's right and wrong. It's just this set of feelings that keep me in line. So what does conscience have to do with thinking freely for ourselves? Well, Kant notices, if you're not willing to talk to me about something, we can't talk about it. You don't even have to pass laws against talking about certain topics if we just won't talk about them. And why won't we talk about them? Because there are certain things that nice people, that good people, just don't talk about in public. I want you to think about the two things you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. And they are, of course, religion and politics. Now, why aren't we supposed to discuss these things at the dinner table? Well, because they lead to fights. They lead to heated tempers and uh, angry words and uh, throwing mashed potatoes across the table and storming out and ruining another Thanksgiving dinner. Now, I want you to think about why this is the case. Why can't we talk about religion and politics? After all, let's pay attention to what we're really talking about when we talk about religion and politics. Religion. We're not just talking about does God exist. What does this matter? Well, the particular religion and the particularities of religion seem to matter insofar as they tell me how to live my life, what role I am supposed to play in the universe, what I owe to whom, uh, how we ought to behave, what we ought to hope for. These are incredibly central, important questions. The meaning of life and what it means to do the right thing. And after all, when we're talking about politics, we are talking about something no less important. We're talking about how we ought to live together, how we ought to treat one another, how we ought to distribute authority and power and resources in a society. These are two vitally important things. If I have an opinion about these things and my opinion might be wrong, this is exactly the sort of thing that I ought to be talking to you about. These are exactly the sort of things that we ought to be talking about at dinner, over lunch, in between class, in class, all the time. And yet, what happens when we actually try to talk about them? Well, now tempers immediately flare up. Why do tempers immediately flare up? Well, here is my hypothesis. That when we talk about these things, we are not actually telling people what we think. We have learned, in fact, not to think about these things. Rather, what you do is you search your feelings. You look into your heart and you figure out your stance on these issues. And so now, when we talk to people about these things, what we're doing is showing other people our feelings. Now, this is a moment of vulnerability. When I show you my feelings, I am opening myself up to you. I am being vulnerable in front of you. Now, what happens when you attack my feelings? Well, when you attack my feelings, my feelings get hurt. And when you hurt my feelings, I want to lash out and fight back. And this seems to be exactly what happens, right? We show each other our feelings. Those feelings get met with resistance. We get defensive. We lash out. And there goes the whole conversation. But here's the problem then. If we can't think about these things together, then we can't think about them at all. 
all we do then is feel about these issues. And again, what Kant notices here is that if we can't talk about these things, then of course you have two choices. You are either the jerk who tries to talk about them anyway, or you are the good person who simply avoids these topics. These topics cause fights, these topics cause heated tempers, these topics break friendships, I'll just avoid them. And so now my conscience, just this desire I have to be a good person and treat other people well, means I will avoid certain topics. Certain topics that are uncomfortable, certain topics that upset people. My conscience will prevent me from talking to you. My conscience will therefore prevent me from thinking freely about certain topics. As one final example here, I want you to think about how difficult it is to have open, honest conversations about sex, about sexual relationships, and about romantic feelings. These are issues that it's just terribly difficult to talk openly about. As men, we are trained really not to talk honestly and openly about sex with our male friends. You just brag or you shut up about it. And of course, uh, we are trained not to really talk about these things with women. Uh, it's either obviously coming on to somebody or it's uh, being weird. And so again, we just uh, avoid them. And so what then so often happens is that we get all of these terrible, stupid ideas about sex, about relationships, about emotions. And all of these things simply perpetuate themselves because as long as I have to keep it in my head, I can't tell what I'm right about and what I'm totally stupid about. I have to be able to talk to other people about this. And now, the internet, which has brought a whole lot of terrible things into our lives as well, I will agree. But what the internet has done is, through this veil of anonymity, it's allowed us to start having some of these conversations with strangers that we can't have with our friends. And so, I don't know how often you've found, but if you have a question about something kind of delicate, you can Google that question. You can go on to some sort of a chat room or uh, a message board, and you can frequently find much better answers, uh, ways to kind of engage with some of these ideas that you just can't with your peers and your friends. This is a way of opening up that public use of reason so that I can actually start to think freely about some of these things for myself. And if you look at the impact this has had on culture over the last decade or 15 years, uh, the ways we are now thinking and talking about sexual harassment, about alternate sexual sexualities, uh, about sexual relationships. All of these kinds of conversations are becoming possible because we collectively are starting to be able to think about these things instead of simply uh, feel and stew about these things. But now if laws and moral rules all stop me from thinking freely for myself, it gets very tempting to say that free thinking is just thinking with no rules at all. The fewer rules I have on my thinking, the fewer rules I have on my speech, the fewer rules I have on my writing, just the more free my thinking is. But as Kant points out, totally lawless thinking is just nonsense. Thinking that doesn't follow any kind of structure or rule set at all just falls into nonsense, and even nonsense doesn't last for long without rules, as Kant points out. And so, free thinking is not thinking with no rules at all. Free thinking rather has to be understood as autonomous thinking. Autonomy is going to be the way that Kant is thinking about freedom here, and free thinking is therefore thinking that is in charge of itself. Now for thinking to be in charge of itself, as Kant will say, this is not a matter of having no rules at all. This is rather a matter of thinking, only having the rules that it gives to itself. Now first of all, Notice all of the other places that thinking can get its rules. We've just been talking about how emotions and desires can rule over thinking. Circumstances and facts can rule over thinking. Kant calls this superstition. We can allow other people to rule over our thinking, tell us what to think and how to think it. When thinking gives itself its own rules, by contrast, what are these rules? Well, 
the rules, the only rules that reason has to give to itself is logic. Logic are the rules of thought and the rules that thinking, that reasoning has to give to itself. And so, free thinking will not be lawless thinking, libertinism, as Kant calls it. Free thinking will rather be rigorously logical thinking. And that's going to be the basis of this philosophical self-examination and this philosophical engagement. Let's stay as just aggressively rational, as logical as we can, and see where our conclusions lead us. That's going to be truly free thinking. Now there's one last issue that I wanted to deal with while we're talking about free thinking. Because as we've been saying, in order to think freely for myself, what I need is to be able to talk to you, to tell you what I think. And when I tell you what I think, what I need is not just for you to hear me out or to tolerate my ideas, I need you to criticize. I need you to show me where you think I've made a mistake, and I need you to think about where you think I might have made a mistake. In other words, in order for me to think freely for myself, you have to be thinking freely for yourself. And so if you won't think for yourself, you prevent me from thinking for myself. And if we can't or won't think for ourselves, we prevent other people from thinking for themselves. In other words, this is uh, an issue where either we all think freely for ourselves together, or none of us thinks freely for ourselves at all. You might say that a threat to freedom anywhere is a threat to freedom everywhere. And so, why should you think for yourself? This is not a matter of it's in your best interest. It's not a matter of it's going to make you happier. It's not a matter of uh, you like doing it. You ought to think freely for yourself because you owe it to the entire rest of humanity. This is, if you don't do it, then you prevent all of us from doing it. You let down mankind. And so you have a moral obligation, an obligation to the entire rest of your species to step up and do the hard work and think for yourself. All semester long, I've owed you an argument as to not just what philosophy looks like, but why you should do it. And here, Kant is going to make the first argument of that kind. You ought to do philosophy, by which I mean you ought to think for yourself, you ought to attempt to think freely, because you have a moral obligation to everybody. You owe it to the rest of us to do your part.